You are listening to Insights from the Conference Board. Hello, my name is Sonia Haas. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Inspiring People, Inspiring Journeys, a series brought to you by the Conference Board. Over this past year, I've sat down with numerous CHROs and we've talked about their professional journeys, the role of the CHRO, what it takes to navigate this complex and demanding career landscape of today, and some of their key insights into ingredients of success for the role and the entire HR function. It is clear that a close and tight partnership with the business and particularly with the CEO is key. So I thought for this last episode of the season, it would be interesting to explore this angle with an established, experienced and successful CEO. And therefore, it is my very big pleasure to welcome to my studio today, Steve Audland, our CEO at the Conference Board. A very warm welcome to you, Steve. Thank you, Sonia. It's great to be here. Thank you. Wonderful to have you with us. And I will start with a question I always ask of our guests, which is, what business are you in, Steve? Uh, tell me a bit more about the Conference Board, uh, our mission, and our history. Well, I'm so proud of the Conference Board, and we both have dedicated years of our lives to, um, to our, our members at the Conference Board. But it has a very proud history of being founded in 1916 at Yama Farms uh, in New York City. It was founded as the National Industrial Conference Board, which is a very long name. Uh, that name was shortened in 1970 to just the Conference Board. But the purpose of the National Industrial Conference Board was to bring forth a gathering or a conference of a variety of business associations. So the term conference does not really mean meeting. It means a grouping like a sports conference. But it's this group of steel and paper and you know, automobile, manufacturing associations. So all these business associations came together and this was the board of directors of that conference of associations. And they, the purpose was to focus on the human capital issues of the time. And not to bore you with all of this, but all of these meetings happened over the course of, uh, you know, many months to years. And they devised the 40 hour, five day work week. They devised the safety standards. They devised the child labor laws, all of which later were memorialized in government regulations around the world. But this group of business people dedicated themselves to settling on that. And that's how the conference board was born. Our work expanded uh, you know, rapidly to economics and uh, eventually the indicators programs and our work around leading economic indicators as an example around the world. And uh, you know, we started doing our um, our first councils in 1926. So oh, wow. a very long, proud history that uh, that runs into today, and we're we're at, at the largest point in the world, uh, our broadest point in the world. Um, I say the sun never sets on the conference board, and I'm, I'm so proud of our of our conference board employees and members all over the world. Well, thank you for sharing that with our listeners, Steve. And um, and, and I was just wondering, is there one insight, one uh, detail of the conference board that you can share with our listeners that maybe is not common knowledge? Well, you know, our public policy center uh, is called, is, is the Committee for Economic Development. And mm -hmm. the CED, or the Committee for Econo Economic Development, uh, was, um, was put together as a separate independent organization in 1942. Uh, that organization merged with the conference board in 2015, so relatively recently. And it had its own proud history. It was devised and brought together as a group of business CEOs who were dedicated to dealing with the aftermath of World War II. And uh, I'm very proud to say that CED wrote the Marshall Plan that I think everybody in Europe, of course, knows, but around the world. And it's our, our founder of CED was Paul Hoffman from Studebaker, who then became the first administrator of the Marshall Plan, and he moved here to Brussels and uh, led the group that, uh, through the post-war period, rebuilt, uh, you know, raised the money, but then also helped to rebuild, uh, rebuild Europe. We also 
uh, were involved with uh, establishing the Bretton Woods agreements, you know, in that era as well. So we have a very proud history at the conference. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with our listeners, Steve. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, the, the, the thought for our conversation today was to explore a bit more the CEO CHRO partnership. But before we dive into that area, I was wondering, I wanted to take the opportunity of having you with me here in the studio to ask you a bit about your role. Um, you know, opportunities, challenges, what does it take to be a, a successful CEO? Well, it's a good question, and I'm not sure that uh, that any two CEOs would have uh, <laughs> exactly the same answer. You know, I've been fortunate to have led a, a number of different organizations, including Top Supermarkets, which was part of the Ahold Global Organization. Uh, I was chairman and CEO of AutoZone and also Office Depot, both global businesses as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one thing I learned uh, as CEO through these, these multiple assignments is that you know, what, what we learned in business school, which was that you must focus on the shareholder, um, is only part of the role, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and I, it, you know, that came, um, that came from, you know, the, the notion that if you took care of the shareholder, you had to then do everything else. But it, it, was, it was assumed that, that everything would come in balance. In fact, though, um, we now live in a multi-stakeholder world, and I think most savvy CEOs figured that out along the way. And you have to, you have customers, and I remembered my, my stakeholders by my title, CEO, customers, employees, owners. Oh. And then I always attended, you know, uh, the environment and community. But, yeah. but essentially, you, you, you can't simply focus on one of those constituents. You can't say, well, I'm, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, it's a customers first and only the customers. Well, if that was the case, then you wouldn't take care of your owners. You wouldn't take care of your employees. You just give everything away free because, mm -hmm. you know, customers first. It, and you could go through each one. If you said the owners first, you know, you maximize profits and, you know, you, you, mm -hmm. but it, it isn't any one. It's the, it's the gestalt. It's taking care of all of these um, constituents in a, in a balanced way to then to, to grow the organization and to, um, and to, to take care of all of, uh, all of your many mouths to feed. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and I'm going to use this opportunity as well as it is a journeys series. Uh, if I could ask you a bit about your journey um, and your professional journey and sp specifically at the point in time when you were promoted to CEO, how that felt and anything yeah. you'd like to share with our listeners. Well, I told you a little bit about um, what, you know, the, the organizations at, at which I worked. I grew up in the consumer products world um, for Quaker Oats and uh, before I became a CEO, but I'll tell you a funny story. So, you know, the term CEO is actually a relatively modern term, chief executive officer, mm -hmm. and it and it really grew out of the, these large multinational companies. Before that, the the lead person in the organization was called the president, and in oh. some uh, countries, there is only the statutory requirement that you have somebody occupy th that title, the president title. So mm -hmm. in the law, it's not codified necessarily that it should be CEO. Well, anyway, so when I became CEO, uh, I, I was, was moving to you know, another state in the United States at that yeah. period of time. My, my mother was still alive, so I called her and I said, well, we're going to have to move. And, it, you know, that, and so and, and uh, I said, and because I'm becoming CEO of this organization. Oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, and then she asked, you know, are the children okay with it, you know. But then she came back at the end of the conversation and she said, now what's a CEO? <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful. It, it, it just really grounds you and, uh, you know. Yeah. But, uh, no, listen, I think it was just such a, it, it's such a great experience. But it's an awesome um uh, responsibility mm -hmm. as well and mm -hmm. I didn't realize that until I became CEO you know how much you know what an, you know what how how incredibly dedicated and responsible I felt for all those m constituents and you know I found myself lying awake at night and worry about you know this employee who is having this issue or this employee you know almost like my own you know, my family and so mm -hmm. I, I have begun to call you know, the employees of our organization, my work family, because that's how I feel mm -hmm. uh, about it. And, you know, all the worries that you have for your children and so forth, it's not that they're children. It's just that they're part of your family and, yeah. you know, the natural care. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Um, now, thinking about the CHRO CEO partnership relationship, which is something I'd like to explore a bit further with you today. Um, for me, it seems like we're a long way away from when I was a business leader at PG 25 years ago when we called HR the policy police. Um, uh, today, HR is a true partner of the business, has a seat at the table, as evidenced by uh, many of the examples that our members at the Human Capital Center share with me, and also that our guests have shared with us in, the, in these episodes. Um, so I, I wanted to understand a bit more your experience of this transition, let's maybe say the last five to ten years. Was there a special point where you really saw the function pivoting into a strategic role? Well, you and I both grew up in consumer products, mm -hmm. um, different uh, different companies. I, I was in food, you were in um, health and beauty care mm -hmm. for the most part, but all, yeah, food also. Yeah. I think we uh, we were blessed because our industry was very progressive as it related to women uh, in in business. Of course, um, I you know <laughs> for the first most of my first half of my career, I reported to women, which is you know yeah. you, you just mm -hmm. you know back in that era it was I thought it was normal, but it wasn't necessarily across the globe, right? Yeah. And, um, but but HR too, you know, has been through a, a process. HR mm -hmm. was viewed as very transactional. Yeah. You know, they hired, they fired, they made sure the trains ran and that uh, you know the people got paid and all of that. So it was, I viewed it as more of a transactional, and so mm -hmm. they, you know, they kept it going. I, I think it has the the function evolved probably beginning in the 80s, but you know, certainly before that in some companies mm -hmm. later, but mm -hmm. beginning in the 80s to become a true human capital organization. Mm -hmm. One that, um, that was, had, had its function just shift because of the shift to a knowledge-based economy. Mm -hmm. And because your assets in most companies began to walk out the door every night, <laughs> uh, there were human assets, and so the responsibility of the human resource function was no longer just transactional. In fact, the majority of it was caretaking these assets. It was recruiting, it was training these assets, making sure we had the right assets and the right positions in order to optimize the business. Um, you know, the, the impact of the interaction with customers was that it was critically important. So the definition of skill sets required for success in each of these areas. So a massive shift in what was expected out of mm -hmm. human, what well, human resources, and now you, we call it human capital, just yeah. simply because that's that's how we believe it, it is. Yeah. No, well, thank you for that um, a reminder of the the journey of, of the function and, and indeed of, of our us as a knowledge society. Um, and today, you know, the, the as said, HR has a seat at the table. It's the CHRO is sitting next to the CFO, the CMO, and all the other C-suite executives at the executive level. And what have you as a CEO observed in terms of that partnership? So first, HR with its peers. Yeah, well, I think you know when this shift happens to happen to a largely knowledge-based economy, and even in the manufacturing world, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that became automated, and so the people were not the people who were you know installing tail lights on a manufacturing line. It was so the leadership, so so the human element has been raised dramatically, and hence the human capital piece. So therefore, mm -hmm. everything else in business is touched by the quality of the people. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't so much a seat at the table as it was the, it, that human capital became the primary role that enabled the success of an organization. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have always, you know, it, and f in my businesses, you know, I've always relied on the CHRO as you know, a close business advisor. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not sure that everybody, that all CHROs understand how important that is, um, you know, because they want to do a good job and they're talking mm -hmm. about their group and their department and gee, is, you know, look at, look at the scores of my team and it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean the true CHROs who understand their roles know that they are there, the trusted advisor, the, the one person in the company that the CEO can say, what do you think? Turn to privately, mm -hmm. what do you think? 
the one person where the CEO can let her hair down and and you know scream, <laughs> you know, um, not literally, but you know, just yeah. really, you know, in front, you know, share frustrations, share dreams, and so forth, and have that partnership, have that advisory, mm -hmm. you know, one to one. I mean, that's how critically it's a part. It's partnerships overused, but it is truly, uh, let's just say, a close, close relationship. Mm -hmm. And and this relationship, this trusted advisor, how is that, you know, how is that created? Um, uh, if I'm your CHRO, I don't enter your office and I say, hey, Steve, here I am, your partner. How is that created, developed, you know, to, to ensure success of the partnership and ultimately also of the business? Well, it does. It starts with trust, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It starts with, with relationship. And, you know, this in a hybrid world or in a virtual world, yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to we have to remind ourselves that we're social beings. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to, you know, not unlike, you know, our personal lives where the, it's, it's truly a relationship. You have to develop a relationship. So it's mm -hmm. not like, you know, uh, a, a CEO can just go hire a person and say, OK, now you're my trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. Or, a, or a, you know, a CHRO can wander in and say, I'm here, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm the one, you know, it, it, but it, it takes time. Yeah. It take and but you really have to spend a lot of close time together. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and really get to know each other on a personal level, and that is difficult sometimes to break down those barriers and make yourself vulnerable mm. to that because we are you know we've become a little formal in our business world, but you know we are still human social beings, yeah. and we need that that level of, of trust and and care about each other, and so it's it's a relationship that 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 is even beyond you know a normal business relationship in my opinion yeah. the best yeah. of those work that way yeah thanks thanks for those insights and i was just wondering for our younger listeners uh, tuning in today younger hr leaders um uh working their their way through their career any tips for them any do's or don'ts uh, uh from your angle well you know so still the hr function has all of these all of these accountabilities mm -hmm. and, and to execute you know you still have to do all the recruiting the hiring firing the assessment you know all you've got to all the rules the enforcers mm -hmm. yeah that all still needs to be done but you know the best HR people are the ones I think that come from the business because they truly then understand the business mm -hmm. Uh, you've seen this in your career as well, and it doesn't require a lot of time there. But but it needs to be somebody who, who has lived in the shoes of the people who are trying to take care of the customer, trying to drive the mm -hmm. growth, trying to drive the revenue. You know, so because it's not all about the HR department. Yeah. It's it's about how do we enable this massive organization and sometimes global um, mm -hmm. it, it to to fulfill its dreams. And in order to fulfill those dreams or those aspirations, it it you know it really does require uh, that we you bring in people who not only can who can deal with today, but we have we develop and we we recruit and we partner with people who can think and dream to tomorrow and then make it happen. So mm -hmm. back to this relationship, yeah. it has it. The, you know, you have to be able to get beyond, you know, the legal stuff. You know, there's so much, there's so much. <laughs> I worry about that. You know, yeah. yes, you must follow all the laws. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, that's like anteing up to play poker. Yeah, you have yeah. to you have to put the ante into the pool. Yeah. Okay, but so let, that goes without saying. The highest level of ethics, the highest level of, but you also need, need to be able to relax a little bit and have normal human conversation mm -hmm. and, and dialogue. And so... You know, you're dealing with the business situation, or and you're dealing with a, a certain person who's not functioning exactly. You need to be able to say, okay, what do we do about this? Mm -hmm. And 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 have a say. So, the the dialogue between a CHRO and a CEO needs to be a safe place. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, and then your 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 vision of the function, the future of the function. Um, you know, it's it's been very inspirational to hear your insights as to the partnership, the safe space. But what about the function as such? Is there anything that you can share with us how you see this evolving? Yeah, well, so building on what we've just said, not to, hopefully not to repeat it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I think more and more 
companies are going to be knowledge-based. You know, with the mm -hmm. advent of AI to deal with mm -hmm. all of the repetitive functions, with with robotics to deal with all of the, you know, the manufacturing, the repetitive, redundant manufacturing, mm -hmm. it elevates humans to really a very different level, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that have to be, in, you know, inspira inspired, inspirational. Um, they have to be uh, ability, able to see the future, divine the future, create the future, and then lead to the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think about some of the greatest innovators in history, in some ways they are eclectic people that would not fit into the machine, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you, you have to sort of caretake them, and um, you know, in order to get the, you know, to get that value. So human, the human capital function is, if you think about it, is caretaking this highly. We think of diversity, in, you know, in terms of gender and nationality or ethnicity, but it's really. It, it will, you know, once that, you know, we, we become this, you know, multi-ethnic, you know, very diverse society, that will no longer be unique, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. the, so what will be unique is the way we think stylistically, mm -hmm. um, you know, how our brains work. And the human capital function needs to evolve beyond that mm -hmm. to be able to recruit and to, how do you, how do you make this this group of people who are all weird. <laughs> we're, I mean, we're all weird. I mean, we let's are. face it. We all, are. We we're are. all unique. We all have these weird things. Yes, we, But absolutely. we're going to get, we're going to get, how do the kids say? We're going to get weirder. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. the human capital folks need to, we got to make all that work seamlessly mm -hmm. without the whole place blowing up. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a remarkable profession uh, in, you know, in the decades ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I do agree with you, Steve, so thank you for that perspective. And I guess that, that brings me to my last um, question, which is not looking just at the future of the function, but future CEOs. I mean, today, many CEOs come from finance, marketing, from different functions, not necessarily from HR. And given both the role HR plays today and also the future of the focus, intense focus on people and organization, do you think we'll see more CEOs in the future coming from the HR lines? Well, in the past, we haven't seen a lot no. of people coming from HR mm -hmm. into a CEO role. Why? Well, because HR has been viewed as this, this you know, narrow function. You you start as a recruiter, yeah. you know, and then you work your way up, you you know, and then you become talent management, and then you maybe you go over and you get a stint in benefits, and then you maybe you go over here and you get a, you know an extent, to, you know, whatever. I, I think the best human capital people of the future will be people who don't just bounce around within the historical function, mm -hmm. but throughout the business. And once you then have experience in you know, running a division or you've been over here and you've taken a stint in finance or manufacturing, wh whatever the core line management of the business, mm -hmm. the industry, the company, H if you are going to be the most effective human capital person in the future, you're going to have to experience a line role. Once you've done that, then... You can, you can see the need for human capital development in a whole different light. Mm -hmm. And then you become the perfect candidate to become CEO because you've not only had the line experience, but you've had the responsibility, the accountability, and the experience in taking care of the people. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I, I've seen my role as CEO evolve from being strategist and business leader to really being mostly about people mm -hmm. and so I think that the best CEOs of the future will be those who have both kinds of experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. That would be a wonderful way to end this conversation. But I do want to give you the opportunity, if you have any final thoughts to share with our listeners today. You know, I just think I would just say this, you know, I I, get, I we've been doing a study of the generations, as you know, mm -hmm. and I'm so inspired by the resilience of each generation, by the dreams of each generation. And I just I would encourage everyone who listens to 
think about your aspirations for yourself for your and for your businesses and to understand that aspirations are different from plans. Plans are these very formal things that you commit to and you're not supposed to miss and they're iterative and you know formal. But aspirations are bigger. And a company and you, we, will never outperform our aspirations. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure they're big enough and that we inspire our people to go for those aspirations. Thank you, Steve. That's a wonderful thought. Thank you so much for joining me today. I definitely learned a lot again, and I certainly hope our listeners did as well. Uh, and thank you to our audience who tuned in for this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our Inspiring People, Inspiring Journeys podcast series, or explore the entire catalog or podcasting program from the conference board on our website. This has been Insights from the Conference Board.